This is my wife's favorite band, by the way. Did you want to try it? Oh, hell no. <laughs> yeah, later, yeah. Two beers later. Yeah, I, 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 can, uh, I can give you a letter, no problem. Yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> and for you too, guys. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Energized? Yeah, okay, good. I'll try to keep it up. A uh, very interesting introduction, thank you, with the, with the dancers and the balance boards, and I've never ever had that before. Um, yeah, so my name is Simo. Uh, I will be talking about ambitious analytics. Um, whoops. The, the um, subheading Google Analytics customization, um, I don't know how many, like what the ratio of Google Analytics users here is versus other analytics tools. I'm, I'm willing to bet it's still quite big, which is why I'm comfortable about talking. Uh, go about Google Analytics. It doesn't mean that these things that I will be talking about don't have to do with everything we do in analytics. All data collection, everything we do uh, should be relevant here. Um, my presentations uh, always, uh, I'm, I'm so bad at finding like stock photos and coming up with good graphs and diagrams and stuff like that. So I have vacation shots. And this was our trip to Norway. <coughs> couple of years ago. We're, this is actually not, not Norway. Uh, this is a lake in Finland, and we're, we're looking into Sweden. So Sweden has all the beautiful mountains. We don't have a single one in Finland. The lake is ours, though. So I will be kind of, I, I'm happy to tell you about my vacations as I go along. Um, and I'm also trying to inspire you to visit Lapland in Scandinavia. It's a beautiful place. This is a very beautiful country as well, by the way, but they have mountains in Sweden. Um, a quick briefly about myself, um, uh, I, I, my job title is Senior Data Advocate, um, doesn't really mean anything, I, I got to choose the title myself, it just sounded really cool, uh, something to do with like old people with, with the senior there. Um, I work in a technology company called Reactor, so I, I'm not agency, I'm not client, I'm not marketing, I'm not advertising, I'm not data, I'm, I'm actually IT. So. Um, uh, and, and it kind of seems to me universal in situations like this that everybody kind of hates IT in one way or another. They're always kind of bottlenecks and really grumpy people in their dungeons just saying no to every cool thing you want to do. Well, I want to prove to you that we are lovely human beings as well. And if you just shower us with love, we will love you back. So it's reciprocal that way. Uh, Reactor is, so we're an IT company. I still do analytics within the IT company, though. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert, another title that doesn't really mean anything. It does give me an, uh, a kind of weird affiliation with Google, so I, I get to kind of, you know, I, I get to have their shirt, <laughs> um, and I, I, I get to talk about Google, but I don't have to kind of talk good things about them. I'm completely entitled to give them hell, which I will proceed to do in this presentation. So I'm, I'm very happy to actually kind of sh shoot down some myths that tools like Google Analytics propagate. And the whole point is that Google is a multi-billion dollar company with their weird looking cars and everything. And it's okay to not be happy with their tools. And I'm sure that all of us have situations where we're not happy with their tools. So now I'm, I'm just telling you it's okay. And, and embrace your hatred every now. You know, you have, have like therapy groups where you just diss Google. It's fine and it's good. It's good for market leaders to kind of know that they, they're not beyond criticism. I also have a blog at simohava.com. So if you're, if you're interested in, in Google Analytics or Google Tag Manager development work, then, then you might want to take a look. I'm also active on social media. I am on Google+, Plus. There's, so there's at least one person there. Um, it's actually a very, very good forum for Google Analytics-related talk. So uh, today, um, I have like three parts in this presentation. The first one is, is just talking about like what I actually want to talk about in the second part, so setting the table. I'm going to be talking about something called plug and play analytics. Um, sounds really good. Like it was, I think it was like the late 90s when plug and play was a really cool thing. You just plugged something in and it works um, with, with Windows. We know that that, didn't really, that wasn't really true, but the idea was cool. So just plugging in, drivers are installed and everything. And today we have the same thing with marketing. So we have these platforms that, that um, promise us like easy integrations and plug and play stuff. Just put it on your site and everything will be fine. Uh, put this pixel on your site and we'll get all this amazing marketing data. 
Um, you know, put Google Analytics on the site, and you'll have data coming in, and you can make build, build your business around it. And I, I, I'm just not happy with that. I, I, I don't think so. I don't believe in it myself. I've never, ever had a situation where I can just plug something in and be happy with the results. I mean, we get some data. We get some results from plugging in these platforms. But whether or not that data is actually useful and whether or not we can use it to grow our businesses, that's a completely different question. So I will be spending a, the first part of this presentation by kind of shooting down this lazy, lazy approach to, to analytics and anything we do in marketing. Second part, we'll have some... Uh, this is my last conference presentation this year, so, which is such a wonderful honor to be here and doing it, but it's going to be kind of a recap. I have like five things that I've been talking about this year that I, if you go to your office next Monday, or, or tomorrow, I think is a work day still. If you're an entrepreneur, then Saturday and Sunday are work days as well. But you can actually go and do them if you want to, so something actionable. And then I'll finish with, with I, don't, I don't know, we'll see. So, something cool. Or something really like, you know, embracing the world and ending with a happy note. Because this is gonna be a bit gloomy, this beginning. So plug and play analytics is, like I said, it's something where you you, you install something, and then you build your business with the information you get from that installation. That's how Google Analytics works. Every single iteration of Google Analytics aims to make it simpler, to make it easier, to make it more accessible. It doesn't look like it. If you've used the UI lately, it, it's far from easy. It's far from usable. It, there's so many different things you can do there. It's so slow. All these different, If you want to use the APIs, you can, but that's difficult as well. So. So um, I should have probably mentioned this, but my, I, I have a few hobbies, but, but the, like the main hobby is, is data quality. <laughs> it's a really, really weird hobby to have, like people snowboard or do skydiving, and I, I just fix data quality issues. It's, um, it's, it's a very weird thing to be passionate about, also partly because it gets a bad rep. So it wasn't long ago that I read a tweet from, from, from someone very, very important in the analytics industry who said that, Stop obsessing about data quality because a good analyst can turn bad data into good insights. You know, well, why not? I mean, if you take a pile of, you know, dog crap and you give it to a sculptor and they sculpt it into a beautiful thing, it's a beautiful sculpture, but it's still shit. So, I mean, if you do the same thing with data, if you have bad data and you sculpt it into beautiful analytics insight, it's still disputable as to if that's actually a valid insight. Because it's so fundamental, the data quality is so fundamental to everything we do, that if we compromise it, if we, if we choose to, let's not invest in data quality, let's start working with the insights right now, we can be doing all this work for nothing. So data quality isn't something you acquire. It's not something that's given to you out of the box. It's something you earn through investment. And so that this just doesn't stay in theory, let's take an example. Google Analytics, huge platform. Uh, Brian Clifton just wrote a blog post where he mentioned it's on 30 million different websites. Or was it 30 million accounts? I think it's 30 million different websites and 15, 10, 15 million accounts or something. That's a crazy amount of businesses using a single platform. A crazy amount of all these different marketing, marketing segments. So if, if you're now the product developer, for, you're the product manager for Google Analytics, and you have to, have to think about how you're going to develop that tool, are you thinking along the terms of, we want to make this tool better for the automotive industry or for the e-commerce industry? We want to make this tool the best possible tool for the fake basketball shoes industry. You, you can't make that decision because then you'll be focusing on single track and ignoring all these other businesses that need Google Analytics. So, you know, millions of different businesses use it, which means that Google Analytics can't be the best for any one of them. It has to be good for all of them. It can't be best for any one of them. I mean, I mean there's no goal, there's no met metric in Google Analytics that says fake basketball shoes sold. There's no metric like that. There, there's no metric um, for, for um, you know, visits from Helsinki, Finland. There's no single dimension for that, even though that's very important for me. There is, a, there is a country dimension called Finland, and there's a city dimension called Helsinki, but they're not grouped together. I have to do the insight myself. 
So Google Analytics has to be a very generic and universal tool, which means that when we adopt Google Analytics, we have to adopt this philosophy as well. We're using a generic and universal tool. There's nothing in that tool particular to our business. And this means that if we want to derive data quality, if we want to improve data quality, we have to understand what the default data quality in Google Analytics is, how it actually works out of the box, right? I mean, I mean we, if we want to use a tool properly, we have to know how that tool works. That's what I'm kind of trying to say in a, nut, in a nutshell. So let's take a look. Here's a report, an actual report. This could be a dashboard. You know, the CMO requested this report, and the marketing assistant first printed it out, then took a, screen, a photo of it, then printed that photo, and then scanned that and sent it as a PDF. And the CMO receives this report on their table. There's always a story. It's important to tell stories with data. We all know that. So, dear CMO, last month the conversion rate on our site was 23.75%, which is an uplift of 3.45% compared to the last month. It's a story. That's what happened last month and this month. And you know what the CMO sees? They see the uplift. They see 3.45%. This is not a vacation shot. This is a fake stock photo party. This is what happens in the boardroom when they see that number. They're celebrating it. They're, they're, they're really like stoked that, yes, you got us more conversion rates or whatever. And then the CMO, is, there's a little nagging feeling on the back of their head. They're thinking, but what does it actually mean? Ah, it doesn't matter. Uplift, uplift. Up. What does it mean? Uplift. You know, so there's this, they should actually, to tell you, I've never been a CMO who actually doubts it. They're just, yes, uplift. The C level is weird in that way. Let's take a look. Conversion rate in Google Analytics. It's the number of conversions, unique conversions per session. So it's, it's like goal completions per session. Um, if, if I go to a website and I convert against their goal, then I'm a conversion. And a conversion rate for my visit is 100. If there are two visits of which one does not convert and I do, then the conversion rate for that site is 50% and so on. So if, if, you can, if, you're listening to, if you're listening to what I'm saying, I have no guarantees of that. But it's per session, per session, per session. Bounce rate, per session. Everything is per session in GA because a session is the default level of aggregation in Google Analytics. Otherwise, we'd be just looking at page views and, and you know, events and transactions. It doesn't really help us understand things like journeys, sequences. So GA punches things up in a session. And conversion rate is, is this session thing. So let's look at what is a Google Analytics session. Here's an exercise for anybody who, who believes they know Google Analytics. It's a group of interactions that takes place on a website. Yes, we can all agree on that. It can be a mobile app as well. I'm not going to be talking about apps tonight. That would be just weird, and we'd be here all night. But on a, it's a group of interactions that takes place on a website. I do something, and then I do something else, then I do something else. That's all part of the same session. OK? Next, there's a 30-minute timeout window. After my latest hit, page view event, whatever, I have 30 minutes time to do something else on the site, or else my session expires. So if, there's a, if I leave, go, go make, boil a pot of coffee, walk the dog, brush my teeth, come back after 29 minutes have passed and do something, it's still the same session. If I come back 31 minutes later, it's a new session. So GA kind of throws me out of that session after 30 minutes, okay? Well, okay, <laughs> that's, that's weird, but we can live with that. It's just, you know, it's a timeout. We have to have timeouts. Otherwise, there would just be one long session. Fine, okay, well, I'll get back to this. Or at the end of the day, you know about this. So if, if you visit the site at 23.59, so one minute before midnight, you have one minute to do stuff and then your session ends. And then right after midnight, when you continue, it's a new session. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's just how it works. It's how they aggregate data. Just imagine if your business worked like that. It, you have a 24-7 store, and the visitor comes in at 23.59, you're like, you have one minute to make a purchase. Otherwise, you have to leave through that door and then come back again in a disguise because you have to be someone completely different, or at least you have to have a completely different intent. So that's how GA works. There's a little catch to this. It's configured to the time zone of the profile you're currently looking at. 
If you have a global website operating in different time zones, and you collect them in the same GA property, and you have different profiles for these time zones, every single one of these time zones will show a different session count, because they all have a different concept of midnight. You know, fine. Or when the acquisition campaign changes. So within the 30 minutes, if you leave the site, but you come back through another door, so let's say you came first through Google Organic, organic Search, you leave and you come back through AdWords, even after one minute, your, your session changes. Google attributes a new session to AdWords, and the old session went to organic. Well, I wonder why they do that. Well, AdWords is the magic word here. They want to attribute traffic to AdWords. They want to attribute traffic to their revenue-bringing campaigns and stuff like that. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that in the name of capitalism. Google has to make money. We'll accept that they want to screw our data because they need to exist. Unless, of course, you add the referral in the referral exclusion list. So if you, oh, let's try this. You come to the site through Google Organic, you leave. Then you come to go to my blog, and I have a link to your site. But you've excluded simoahava.com as a referral. You will still be part of the organic session, because you've told GA that anybody coming from simoahava.com, I don't need to know that. They're still part of the old session. So that's you know, how you fight with acquisition campaigns. This is how you work with tools like PayPal or, or a bank, you know, bank sites. So if your e-commerce site throws someone to PayPal to make the purchase and they return to the site, unless you've set PayPal as a referral exclusion, the entire purchase will be attributed to PayPal because they're the last acquisition campaign, they're the last referral campaign. So that's a very good thing in a way. Then there's cross-domain tracking, so you know, cookies can only be stored on the top-level domain, simoahava.com. If I go to simoahava's fake basketball shoes.com, it doesn't exist, don't try. Um, it will be a new session and a new user unless I use something called cross-domain tracking, which passes the cookies from one top-level domain to another to accept cross-origin and fight the same origin policy of web browsers. We don't need to know this stuff because it's ridiculous. Unless you implement it incorrectly, which is <laughs> usual because it's so difficult to do, you can use Google Tag Manager to manage all this stuff. Unfortunately, that's pretty difficult as well, no matter what they tell us in the marketing speech. Oh, there's also something called the session control parameter, right? So now let's talk about that 3.45% uplift against this. So when we have the guy in the boardroom and he's showing the results, dear CMO, Last month, we had a 3.45% uplift. Do you think he's actively contemplating the ramifications of what he's saying? Conver conversions versus this mesh of algorithms here. Do you think the people in the boardroom respect that? Do you think they know what he's talking about? No, because they all see, just see the 3.45% uplift. Now, this has two implications, two major implications on how we approach data. The first one is, the closer we are to those horrible buckets called total visits, total conversions, total bounce rate, the further we are from the truth. Those are so heavily sessionized, so heavily aggregated, that the 3.45% uplift can be an anom a complete anomaly if we're looking just at total conversions. We need to segment, we, you know, we need to combine data, we need to build a bridge between our CRM and our, our analytics tool or our sales engine and our CRM. We need to think about ways how to kind of combine these verticals together, because as we know, data is multidimensional. It's not just your web data, it's not just your app data, it's all these things. Segmentation, like the number one tool in an analyst's toolkit, if you're not segmenting, you're not doing analytics. So you need to drill down. Instead of looking at, show me all conversions um, for the time period, what about just show me people who have already converted before, or show me people who spent more than 5,000 euro on this site. So we create these segments and cohorts. Then there's things like visualizations and predictions, which are like level two stuff. You have to kind of gain a level in the, in the game that is analytics. And here's another example. So when I, said, when I mentioned when you use Google Analytics, you have to accept the definitions. Well, here's an example. All these aggregate metrics, e-commerce conversion rates, session duration, page use, session bounce rate, new users, new sessions, sessions. Remember that algorithm thing I showed you with all the midnight things and others. If you change the concept of a session even the slightest bit, 
if you, if you change the session time out to 31 minutes instead of 30 minutes, or 29 minutes instead of 30 minutes, if you, add, if you change the time zone of your profile by one hour, if you add a new referral in the referral exclusion list, if you fix your cross-domain tracking, every single one of these metrics will change as a result. That's how incredibly fragile the relationship between this weird, fictitious algorithm and your actual business is. So now, in light of all this, if you're talking about conversion rates and uplifts of 3.45% without understanding this stuff, it's possible you're just talking about an effect, a completely technical thing. Yeah, the developer finally fixed cross-domain tracking, so we got an uplift of 3.45% in our conversion rate. And unless we understand this, or unless the person who's talking to me about their conversion rates understand this, I'm not obliged to believe in anything they say. Because I'm trying to understand my business, but what they're doing is they're describing metrics. So ever so often we have these people in the boardroom and in the idea brainstorming sessions saying, fix our bounce rate metric. What do you say to that? If, if I'm a consultant and you ask me to fix your bounce rate metric, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I can fix it. I can shoot two page loads with every single page and you'll have a 0% bounce rate in no time. I can, I can send an event after one second that destroys your bounce. I can take your bounce rate down to zero at any time I want. If you ask me to improve your conversion rate, that's not a better question, it's the same thing. I can, I can create a conversion goal that matches every single page on your domain, which means you'll have a conversion rate of 100% because everybody visits a page. That's fixing metrics. What, you, what people should be asking, I'm just so bewildered why they don't, is fix my content so that as a result, my bounce rate gets better. Fix my funnels, that sounds kind of pervy, but it's not. Fix my website funnels, so as a result, the conversion rate on my site will improve. That's the line of thinking we should be doing, but we get so focused on these stupid tools. This is the only thing we want to improve, not the actual funnel behind it. So the second implication is, all these metrics that you saw, all these metrics that we use, they're all session outcomes, right? You can't have a conversion without, an out, without a funnel before it. And it doesn't describe the funnel, it describes the stuff that falls out of the funnel. And, well, let, let, let me put it like this. In my opinion, my job isn't to improve the number of conversions, per se, which is at the bottom of the funnel. My job is to make the funnel look more like a cylinder rather than a cone, like an inverted cone. So I need to make the funnel throughput much better so that the conversion rate improves as an offshoot, but at the same time, I'll have improved the site itself. So I'm focusing all steps of the funnel. So one of the things that I've been doing this year a lot, and, and actually last year and the year before that, is just talking about funnels, and funnel, funnel this and funnel that, you know. It's a, it's a good topic in pubs, um, I, I guess. I don't, don't really get good feedback there either. but. Um, so we, we, we use funnels, we use tools like enhanced e-commerce reporting because it has funnels. And when you look at funnels long enough, you stop worrying about conversions, you start thinking about funnel abandonment. So non-conversions that should be conversions, and that's a much more powerful thing to work with. So this was the first kind of, you know, up and Adam talk uh, of this presentation. The second part is now talking about what about these funnels. And what do we actually do to improve a platform like Google Analytics? And yes, we need to improve it. It's not a good platform out of the box. It's not. It's complex, it's arbitrary, it's dictatorial. It tells us what to do instead of us telling it, it what to do. So we need to actually start thinking, how do we turn Google Analytics to our benefit? So. It's an investment, first of all. It's not free. Google Analytics, oh, my favorite marketing pitch. But Google Analytics is free. It's such a good, it's not free. The license is free. Of course, you pay, pay for it with your data. But working with it is not free. You put hours into it. So people kind of tend to forget that. There are analytics platforms that have a very expensive license, but which are much easier to install and upgrade, I'm sure. You can build your own, build your own Amazon endpoint, start collecting data there. Uh, use tools like Snowplow Analytics. They're, they're cheap, 
Amazon Endpoint is ridiculously cheap. The cost of data storage, there is nothing, but it costs money because you have to put hours into it. So, oh, this is from central Finland, another beautiful lake. It's the uh, longest lake in Finland, 100 kilometers. It's called Päijänne. Päijänne. Päijänne, yes. Very good. We can. Päijänne. Sounds like somebody yawning. Very, yeah. So, uh, the f I had five, five tips here. So, the first three are, are kind of together. So, if you look at them apart, they'll look really boring. So, don't leave before you've seen all three. So, the first one we want to do is true hit timestamp. Now, if, if you've been working with data, uh, if you've been doing queries with SQL, or if you've been working with tools like BigQuery, or if you've been trying to build these kind of customer lifetime things, you'll respect how important it is to know when something happened, right? We want to know when a conversion happened. We want to know when, when the person first visited the website. Now, Google Analytics has this funny little thing where it doesn't actually tell us when something happened. It just gives us a bunch of hits, page views, you know, events, transactions. You can drill down. You can look at which date it happened. You can look at the hour it happened. You can even look at the minute of the hour it happened. You can't look at the seconds or the, or the milliseconds. And also, the concept of time is translated to your Google Analytics time zone again. So if someone from New York visits my blog at 4 p.m. their time, I'm looking at my blog and saying, hey, somebody came at 11 p.m., well, that's quite late. No, it's 4 p.m. their time, but GA tells me it was 11. So the first thing we'll do is we'll fix this horrible, horrible error in Google Analytics. We'll be adding a hit timestamp on every single hit. We want to label the hits when they occurred. Because another imp important thing is, when your CRM or your sales engine is accepting uh, like purchases and they're collecting stuff, what people buy on your site, is it party time already? There's stuff falling from the roof. Cool, very nice, nice add, nice touch to this thing. So we want to know when that happened, precisely to the millisecond, because then we can look what happened on the CRM. So it's, you know, this is Google Tech. No, sorry, this is Google Analytics. We create a new custom dimension. I will be sharing these slides, by the way, and there's some links to the article, so you don't have to kind of take photos if you don't want to. You can if you want. We create a custom timestamp, a dimension called timestamp. It has a hit scope. We want every single hit to have their own dimension. Uh, then we do this little JavaScript thing, which creates an ISO time, so International Standards Organization timestamp. It's, it's a standardized way of, of displaying time basically. I, I, we can do live debugging of the code later after a couple of beers if you want. Then in Google Tag Manager, we add this dimension to every single tag that's firing stuff to GA. So now whenever any hit gets past the GA, it gets carried with a timestamp. So what we get is something like this. We have a page view that happened May 7th, 2.45 a.m. at minus 7. UTC, right? So this, is, this would be something like, you know, I think it's New York, or maybe Midwest, Chicago, something, I don't know. But anyway, now we can see exactly when a hit happened. Ooh, it's not exactly mind-blowing stuff. I can see you're all a bit disappointed. I'm, I'm, I understand that completely. So like I said, there's three parts to this thing. I'm kind of hyping it now, so I hope it's going to be really good. OK, so the second one, this is, a, this is what we call a mountain in Finland, by the way. It's, not, it, it's called a fell. I don't know if they have it in other, they have it in Sweden and Norway, but it's called a fell. It's like a mountain that's not really a mountain. It's a hill with a flat top. So we only have those, but it's really cool looking. It's called uh, Salla. And this is Kilpisjärvi. <laughs> Kilpisjärvi is our, another lake. So after that, what was it? Oh yeah, client ID, right. So GA identifies users based on a cookie. Right? So we have a cookie that tells us this person has visited the site before and they have this client ID. It's a random number which gets assigned to every single user. So every single user has a client ID. It goes a bit deeper than that. Actually, every single browser has a client ID. When you change browsers, your client ID changes, unless you're doing those cross-domain tracking things and everything. But anyway, we want to know that it's not exposed by default. So we don't, when we look at Google Analytics data, we don't know if these hits belong to the same user, unless we build a really complicated segment. But with this little trick, we can now see every single hit that belonged to the same client ID. 
So we create a custom dimension. This time it's user scope, so it's scope to all hits from that cookie. It's a oh, bit more code. It's a bit more difficult in GTM. You have to do some custom HTML stuff. Completely doable, but it's a bit more intricate. Then we add it to your tag, and it gets sent to GA. This is all stuff that's in the articles that I've linked to, by the way, so, so no need to kind of do it right now. But what we get is we get that this client ID, which is different from this client ID, so they're different browsers, this one had five sessions through Google Organic, this one had just one. If we didn't send client ID, we just see six sessions from Google Organic. Now we can actually see which user did what. Which browser did what? So, okay, I can feel a bit disappointment is obvious in your eyes. It, this wasn't either the kind of thing you were looking for. Well, we're getting there. This is just one third of the cake. This is from Lofoten, a very, very beautiful peninsula in northern Norway. One of the most beautiful places in the world. I'm, I'm no way affiliated with, they don't pay me to advertise them, but it is one of the most beautiful places in the world. The third thing that's missing. So now we know when a hit occurred, who did that hit or which browser did that hit. But now we don't know if those hit occurred in the same session. And that's really critical, right? Because we need to know if they happen in the same session. We need to know if there's a conversion rate implication with it. So the third thing we'll do is we'll add a session ID. And this is, again, a custom dimension, just some session scoped, of course. A very simple JavaScript thing this time. This just creates a random string, a unique random string. And then we send that random string with that session. So now every single hit in that session will have this. So now we can see that these four event actions were created in the same session because they all have the same session ID, right? Without this, we wouldn't know that they took part in the same session. So now we're coming to the great buildup. <laughs> I'm really nervous. So this is what you get. <laughs> oh, it's such, such a kind of disappointment again, but let me walk you through what's going on here. Maybe you'll respect my efforts. Um, we have a series of hits on Google Analytics. The first one, how do I know it's the first one? Well, I look at the timestamp. Oh, it's all coming together now. It was a page view on the root page, just a slash. It happened at 12.45 p.m. plus three hours. I should have added if it's daylight saving times or not, but I think this is DST. User ID, I skipped that because that's kind of thing you should be doing already if you have authentication. But it basically, it's another level of aggregation that groups all these different browsers with one single user. So now we can also see that when the hit happened, what session it happened in, which browser made it, and which user owned that browser. So anyway, let's get back to this thing. We can see what's created by this client ID in this session, okay? I know you can't read this small font in the back, so I'll just try to be as descriptive as possible. The next thing we see is a page view to a page called subscribe, which is where you subscribe to my, you know, diet pill ordering form. It took place one minute later, so one minute after they hit the home page, they went to the subscribe page. Same user, same browser, so they're still using the same browser, and the same session. Okay, so now we can logically say that this person first went to the home page, then they went to the subscribe page. It doesn't sound cool, but actually in GA, this is really, really significant. You can't do sequential stuff in GA unless you build segments. Now we can do a sequence. It's weird. GA is weird like that. The next thing we see from the same user is that event called subscription successful. Happened 12 minutes later. Still the same session. Sorry, still the same session and still the same browser. So now we know, okay, so the guy, person came to the website, they went to the subscribe to the new uh, diet pills thing. <laughs> what would you subscribe? Let's use newsletter, that's better. So they went to the subscribe to a newsletter thing and, um, and then they subscribed because they sent a subscribe, subscription successful event. We also know they took them 12 minutes to fill the form. That's interesting data. What happens next? Well, if we didn't have user ID here, the next thing we'd see is a hit on my account. But because we have user ID, we can see that the same user ID had a hit to subscribe, question mark, verify equals true. So they went to this verification page um, some 14 minutes after the subscription successful event. It's a different client ID, so they changed browsers. What? 
And of course, a different session because the client ID has its own session, like concept of a session. So what has happened here? Well, they got the subscription successful thing. Then it said that you have a verification link in your email. So they open their mobile phone because for some reason they don't want to use their desktop. And they find the link and they click it and they verify themselves on the mobile phone. We wouldn't know that if we didn't have the user ID. We just see a random hit by a random client ID in a random session on Subscribe Verify. So now that we have the user ID, we can aggregate that. And then uh, 20 minutes after that, we see another hit on my account. So they've created an account, verified the email address. It's the same one as before, the same browser. It's a new session, of course, because it's more than 30 minutes after the previous thing. So with these three little things, we're building a sequence. And now again, like, so what? Well, you know about this offline world out there somewhere, <laughs> and we might have a situation, and we actually do have a retail store as a customer, for example, where we're interested in knowing what they do in the store. And this gets really kind of, you know, Orwellian and thought, you know, police stuff. We can see now that when we have an offer, people take out their phones and log into, we have this app where you log into, they look at the offer, then they go to a store terminal, look for where that thing is located on. They can actually call seller assistant with the app, so they call seller assistant next. Then they proceed to make the purchase and we send an offline hit to GA with that. And after that, they have a feedback, how was your thing going on? And this, this can all happen across different devices. With this method, we can now build this journey and we can see what the approximate distance between these hit points is, for example. We can start talking about real customer journeys, not just those flimsy ones that GA gives us, like time lag and path length. We can now actually see what is the exact sequence of events that people take, what devices they prefer in that sequence, so that we can optimize the process to all these different touch points. Here we see that this person chose to verify their account with mobile phone. Why on earth did they do that? They were sitting in front of a computer. Why did they pick a mobile phone? Well, perhaps the mobile phone was the first one to alert them of the email, and they checked it, oh, I have an email, and they looked at it, and it was a verification thing. Perhaps, and this is bad, the newsletter never got sent to, or, or it got sent, but it was completely unreadable in the desktop computer. We use this to optimize the journey. We don't care about individual hits. We care about what happened in these sequences. So that was the thing, you know. We access raw, unsessionized data. And building stuff like this is easy. Building insights out of it is difficult. That's how analytics goes. Building stuff is usually easy, but creating stories out of it is more difficult. So we need a lot of these examples so that we can aggregate the data and look for trends. But we have to do these, because otherwise we'd just be looking at these two columns. These two columns are what we get by default. We get none of this other stuff. So what, what the hell can we do with this stuff? I don't, I don't know. It's just random hits with, you know. So we do this stuff to gain a better understanding, and GA doesn't give this to us by default. GA Premium does, but that's cheap. It's just $150,000 a year. So they give us that, but we have to do it ourselves in the free version. Okay, another one from Lofoten. It has fjords, beautiful fjords and fisher, fishing villages. Uh, Peter already spoiled this for me. Damn you, Peter. But uh, so, <laughs> well, actually, uh, this is a two-year-old thing anyway, so I think I spoiled it myself a couple of times. But I have a use case for it. So weather is another thing. Google has its own weather APIs. It has its own geolocation APIs. So I've always wondered, why do they not have weather as a standard dimension in their reports? It's easy. They can just geolocate the IP and look at the weather, what, what the weather was like. Well, we can, of course, build this ourselves. Here's a flow chart. I heard that flow charts are really appreciated. So this is how it works. You know, it, it geolocates the visitor, then it pulls the API, then it parses the information, and then it sends it. So what it essentially does, it looks at where you are currently, and then it asks from an API, what is the weather like where this person is? It's based on IP geolocation, so of course it doesn't work if you're using proxies or VPNs or spoofing your IPs because you want to do some dirty stuff. But it's reasonably good. So it has some custom dimensions. Again, you can create one for weather itself, which is just a single word that describes the weather. It can be cloudy, rainy, snowy. I've seen dust as a weather type, which is really, really concerning. 
and it has you know temperature. You can send what the temperature was and so on. There's some JavaScript again, which does the API call. It's all done in Google Tag Manager, by the way. So you don't need to, you don't need to bother the developer. You can because we like to be bothered, really. But you can do it yourself in a custom HTML tag. Then you send it with with an event to JS. What you get is a report like this. So here we have the weather, clear, cloudy, and rain. The three I took for this example. Sessions with that weather over the past you know 30 days. And then I have two goal conversion rates. The first one is for booked green fee, and the second one is booked simulator. So it's golf, okay? So this was a golf course client, and they wanted to know, does weather affect people's willing to play golf? They actually asked that. You know, you'd think that they know the answer by then. Playing golf in the rain, is just, it just sucks. But they wanted to see the data behind it for some reason. Uh, for a very good reason, actually. And so we did a little test. We, we saw that, you know, booking the green fee. One thing we did first, by the way, because a golf course doesn't care about what the weather is like where the user is, right? I could be going to golfing 300 kilometers away. It doesn't matter what, what the weather is like here. I'm interested in knowing what the weather is like in the golf course. I'm also probably not going to be playing golf today because it's Tuesday, but I might be willing to play golf next Saturday because that's the most popular day for golf in Finland. So what they did was they were actually measuring weather predictions next Saturday at the golf course. So we saw that if it was clear, it, has, it, had, a, it had a reasonably good conversion rate. Uh, cloudy didn't matter that much, pretty much the same. But if it was raining, if people saw that it's going to rain next Saturday at the golf course, they were like, nah, I'm not going to go there. Or, you know, what an insight. If it's going to rain, you don't, you don't want to play golf. So they were very happy that we confirmed their silly hypothesis. What they did with the data, however, or what we did later on was interesting. They also have a simulator. They have a sauna. They have, all the, they have a really good restaurant. <clears throat> so what we started doing is we started feeding this data into their content personalization system. It's, it's, based on, it's like a real-time decision-making platform, which shows you um, content dynamically based on your previous actions on the site and these different contexts, such as weather. And we saw that if we start, sorry, it's like the worst place ever for a seam. That's the seven. So we saw that if we dynamically push content that promotes our simulators when it's going to rain next weekend and pushes our sauna services and our, our, you know, our restaurant, people had a tendency to book those because they had already time boxed the golf thing. But now that it's going to rain, they're like, oh man, I just managed to get like eight hours away from my family. And now I actually have to spend time with them. But hey, here's this simulator. I can just go and chuck balls at this canvas. Then I can take a sauna and eat some ceviche afterwards. So it, as it turned out, this thing that came out as self-evident and like a stupid hypothesis, because we all knew that, turned into something very beneficial, but only because we saw it in the data that this margin was so large. And this is just a small subset. But it was very clear that, that weather had an effect on golf. And we can do this all in Google Analytics. Naturally, we pull the data and push it into the RTD system, which does the uh, con content stuff. But we can now do this. And this is what, why, why we bring these additional dimensions to GA. GA didn't have any weather dimension. They didn't have any book green fee. We installed them there ourselves because we had to make the data more meaningful for us. We had to make it more significant for our business case. OK, so the final way, to think we saw this picture already. I can't believe I've been so lazy. Oh, well, yeah, it was there. This was Salla. Oh, man. Proofreading is a good idea, my friends. So the last one is content as e-commerce. So uh, um, bounce rate is my all-time, you know, oh, dear. It's my all-time favorite metric. Um, it's supposed to describe a person arrives on the site. They're so violently offended by the site that they leave immediately, never to come back. Uh, Avinash Kaushik, who's this passionate Indian guy working for Google as their evangelist, he says the bounce rate is the I came, I puked, I left metric. You know, you're, you're so kind of disturbed by what you were seeing that you had to leave immediately. Well, my dears. Bounce rate is, is, is a metric that describes single interaction visits, a single interaction, usually a page view of the landing page. We have no idea how long they spent there, actually. We don't know what they did. 
My favorite example is I'm driving a car, I'm trying to find your business. I, I, I had to go there because I want to buy all, all, everything you have on your shelves. I'm driving the car, I'm going, what is the address? I'm doing the illegal thing where I grab my phone, I Google it, driving, the, oops, still driving, Googling, 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 found it, clicked the link, found the address, put it back in my pocket. Now I go to your store and I buy you, like, you know, buy all your shelves empty. That's a good bounce. I'm a bounce, right? I just visited the site, I found the address, I left immediate. I didn't puke. Do you want me to stay longer on this site and have a car crash? Are you like, we want to give you the address, but first you have to push through these five different pages of our promotional material. You have to download, you have to click the CTA, you have to subscribe to a newsletter. I'm driving, I want to find the address. I was a good visitor. Google Analytics told me I was a bounce. It's like, a pff, get out of here. I was good. I'm really, really good for you. I bought a lot of stuff. Um, you know, that's just how it is. If you have a single page app with nothing more than a landing page and a couple of things, and you don't measure the CTAs, I can call every single number on that page, buy millions of dollars worth of your mer merchandise, call all my friends, ask them to do the same, and I'm still a bounce. So I'm still a horrible person, apparently. That was a rant, I'm sorry. I've tried to you know, control these feelings, I have therapy for that. So what about if we shift away from the bounce rate, which is another one of these session outcomes, and we start talking about funnels instead? Now, like I mentioned earlier, Google Analytics has this thing called enhanced e-commerce which lets you see like, how you pass through these different milestones on the website, how different products pass through them. You can measure add to carts, cart abandonments, checkout funnels, you know, product views, impressions. What about if we treat our content as a product and start doing that as well? So let's look at what we get. This is installed on my blog right now. My blog has only content. There's no merchandise. I want to have merchandise, but I can't find somebody to make you know, life-size figurines out of me. But I just have content at the moment. So this is what my report looks like. I had 51,000 sessions at some time period where 3,500 never visited an article page. Out of people who visited an article page, the 44,000, 7,000 didn't scroll at all, so they just opened the page and did nothing. They were just like looking at the headline, like what a horrible headline. Or maybe they did what everybody does, which is open a page in a new browser tab and never look at it again. You know, that's what we do. We open them because we're gonna look at them later, but we don't. So that might be them. Then, you know, we have out of the people who did scroll at least a little bit, 4,500 never reached one third. So they just scrolled quickly, just looked, uh, this sucks and left. Out of the people who did scroll past one third, this many never reached the end of the article. So they just scrolled up to somewhere in between. And this is how many people out of all sessions, 29% out of all sessions had somebody who read an article. So reached the end and spent at least 60 seconds on the page. Now I, I recognize the problem of using the word read because I don't know if they actually did read it but I'm using indicators like scroll to the bottom and spend 60 seconds. But anyway, we can actually zoom on this huge block here because this is a bit weird. So we'll see, this is a checkout funnel. So a checkout is when you start reading and reach one, when you've reached one third, that's the first checkouts page. When you reach two thirds of the article, that's the second checkout, and when you reach the end, that's the third checkout. And then when you spend 60 seconds, you buy the, you buy the article. Now we can actually see that it's pretty linear, so I'm happy. I mean, there's a bit of a chain difference here, it's a bit bigger leap. But I can see that, you know, the longer, the, <laughs> the more people spend more time on the top of the article than the scroll down, and that's amazing insights. Only analytics can provide us these. Surprise, surprise. But anyway, so here I am looking at my content through funnels. I don't really care about these transactions. I don't care about the read rate. I care about why didn't these guys reach, why isn't this one this high? Why isn't this one this high? What is it about my articles that are only allowing a certain amount of reading to read through? So next thing I look, I look at the articles. So here are my articles. There's some uh, products here like variable guide, trigger guide. Revenue, I told you I don't have any merchandise. So what I do is I actually measure the number of words on the articles. So I had 
39, uh, sorry, 38 million words were read on my blog. <laughs> that's such a cool vanity metric. That's the kind of thing I have, like huge cat-sized letters on my bedroom wall. And um, average length of the article is 1,900 words. There are some longer articles, 5,100 words, and so on. And what enhanced e-commerce, it gives us these two wonderful ratios. So there's the card to detail rate, which tells me what is the percentage of uh, sessions that included an add to cart out of all the people who open an article. So if you open an article and start it scrolling, because sc scroll start is, start is add to cart, you're a cart to detail guy. If you never scrolled, you're not in this. So we can see that 84% by average ends up scrolling an article. I, I, I think I'm happy with that. I don't have any other blogs to benchmark against, but I'm, I'm really impressed by how people are willing to scro scroll on my blog. You know. Good scrollers, I call them. And it's the same across articles. There's no really big differences. So I can, be, I can trust that the headline and the ingress are usually pretty good. And then there's the buy to detail rate, which tells us out of people who opened the article, how many ended up buying it. So how many ended up reaching the end and spending 60 seconds on it. And now I can see some differences. So the really long article, 5,100 words, only has a 14% um, by to detail rate, whereas a shorter article, which had 2,900 words, has a 31% by to detail rate. So again, be prepared for analytical insight. The longer the article, the fewer people read it. <laughs> and this is all free consultation for you guys, by the way. You don't have to pay me anything. <sighs> you think, after reading this, only write short articles. Well, we all know that's not true. I mean, you don't need a read through to be happy. I write reference guides. I have chapters there that people, people can skim through. I don't care about the read-through rate. What I am interested in is knowing, however, why does an article with 3,700 words gain a 17% byte to detail rate, whereas an, another article with just 100 wo more words gain a 21% read-through rate? What's the difference? They have the same amount of words. Another insight, size doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, it's not just about the length. That was a poor, you know. <laughs> it's not just about the length of the article, not the number of the words. It's also about content, as it turns out. So this article that had the smaller rate is called, it's called uh, Advanced Form Tracking in Google Tag Manager. I don't know. I, th I thought it was a good article. But I accept, maybe some people just don't like it. Um, and the other one is called Trigger Guide, which is very, very popular because it was a new thing like some time ago. Or there's this article called The Data Layer, which has a pretty, sh pretty small read-through rate compared to another one called E-commerce Tips. Well, e-commerce tips, it's like really, really interesting stuff. Like clickbaity headline, e-commerce tips. Marry them together, you'll have a good business. The Data Layer, yawn, you know, Data Layer. <laughs> I just get tired by talking about it, so no wonder it gets a smaller read-through rate. This is how I dissect my work. This is my hobby. Apart from data quality, I also am crazy about blogging. So this is how I improve myself as a writer. I look at these funnels. How do these certain articles behave in these milestones? So what I want to wrap this up with is something I, I kind of, you know, we're all here because what we do is difficult. <laughs> you know, if this were really, if marketing were easy, if selling, you know, stuff is easy, we wouldn't be here. There would be no need for conferences. We'd all be, you know, drinking Mai Tais in the Mediterranean. Um, turns out data is pretty difficult, you know. Big data is, is, is a thing, like the previous presentation told us. It's, it is a thing. It's something that we need to actively work towards. Um, growing a business with data is difficult. GA tries to tell us, no, no, it's easy. Just plug it in and look at the page views, and you'll know how your business is doing. It doesn't work like that. It's so unbelievably difficult that we have to take these platforms and turn them to work for us. And then when we put all these hours into GA, we put like hundreds of hours and we have these beautiful reports, that's when we realize this is just like one, you know, one hundredth of what our business is doing. We have our stores, we have our CRMs, we have our customer relationship management, we have our call centers, we have our, you know, cruise ships, we have our salespeople, we have our social media. It's just one little shard of that beautiful diamond that is your business. So, you know, data is difficult because it's supposed to be difficult. It's supposed to be a competitive field where the person who knows best usually wins. 
So to reiterate a point I made earlier in a very verbose way, data quality is directly proportional to how we understand data collection. So if we want to work on data, if we want to make data a bit less difficult, we have to learn how the platform works. We have to understand what these underlying things like sessions and stuff are. And we have to know how we can take a platform and mold it into something that works for our business. And once we do that, then we can have like a genuine stock photo party. It doesn't have to be the fake kind. And our boardroom can actually smile and be pleased about the 3.45% uplift because it's an actual uplift in business, not just a weird technical thing that we missed. And that's all I want to say about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sima. Cheers. So uh, we have some, uh, some questions from, uh, from Twitter. The first one, uh, is Google Analytics just for uh, search in engine optimization? I don't use it for search engine optimization, so I don't think so. It's, no? it's, it's, uh, it's, I think it's a, I, I used to do SEO, but I don't do it anymore. Uh, it, it's, it's a good tool for anything you want to measure that can send hits to an HTTP endpoint. I use it for measuring app performance and website performance and what people do once they enter the website. Many people use it for SEO. We all know why it sucks for SEO. It's because we don't know the keywords the people use. It's the not provided thing, right? It's still good for SEO. We can still see. The content thing I showed, that's very SEO, right? Hasn't, hasn't SEO been for a long time just create good content, you know? That builds links and relationships and stuff like that. So of course we need to know about engagement and how people are interacting with the content. That's SEO at its heart. It's SCM as well. It's, it's social media as well. So GA doesn't let, it might be better for some disciplines out of the box, but once we put data into the, once we invest money into it and turn it to our benefit, it can be good for any kind of discipline we want to do. It's not good for display impressions. We don't, we, GA doesn't collect information about how many people saw a display on their network unless you're paying for double click. So it's not good for that, I can tell you that, but you can, mm -hmm. for other stuff it's very good. Okay, and the uh, second one, uh, would not it be better to count the conversion rate uh, considering unique users than, uh, rather than sessions? Oh yes. Indeed, so. absolutely. So that's one of the big like, you know, things that I've been... I think they said it first time four years ago in a partner summit that they're going to come up with a user-based conversion rate. Um, so conversions per user, much better. However, a user in Google Analytics is the client ID, unless you're using the user ID views. So when you're looking at uh, conversions per user, you're actually looking at conversions per browser. So if I go to your website with my iPad, my iPhone, and desktop, I'm three different users. And I can convert against each one of them, and then you'll have a 100% conversion rate for me as a human being. But what if I only convert with my desktop? Then you'll have a one-third conversion rate for me as a human being. So that's the problem. With the little trick I showed you with the table, I can see that this user ID converted just once. It had the subscription successful, whereas there were two different client IDs. So only one of those client IDs converted, so only one of those GA users converted, but my user ID converted once. So that's exactly how we solve it. But you're exactly right. Sessions don't convert, but users do, right? There's no such thing as a converting session. There's a, there's a human being interacting with the website and doing th stuff that's good for a business that converts. So a very good, good thing that you brought that up, whoever wonderful person mm -hmm. that Thanks. was. Maybe we have some more questions from audience? Okay. Uh, hi, Simo. So hey, thanks for, uh, for this speech. Really, really emotional. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so let me just get it straight, uh, if I got to understand it correctly. Um, I have two questions. So first of all, does the enhancing e-commerce solve uh, quite a bit of problems that you face with Google Analytics, like cross-device, client ND, and stuff like that? Uh, and second, once you get that raw data, um, is Google Tools enough to go through that, or do you use some particular like R coding or something like that for you? So, so, so what's the first question? Is enhanced e-commerce good to fight the session thing? You mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So, very good question. Uh, enhanced e-commerce is session-based, right? So it has the same underlying difficulty, but only if you look at the transactions. So only if you only look at the conversion rate, because that's a session outcome. But if I'm interested in knowing like um, what is the proportion of checkouts to this product's add to carts, for example. 
It doesn't really matter that they happen in the same session or not. I'm just interested in knowing, like, what is the potential of this product to pass through this particular funnel, regardless of session? But yes, enhanced e-commerce has the same underlying flaw that it's session-based. There's no such thing as a, for example, if your website has, a, you can save stuff in the cart, like Amazon and you leave that site and then you come back later to Amazon and you open the cart, Google Analytics will report that as cart abandonment on the first one. And the second one will be just weird because you start with a ready cart. So that is a problem. It, kind of, it very much affects how we approach the data. But my kind of thesis here is that by just by looking at the funnels alone, we're able to look at these pain points and fight them much better than what we do if we just know that 75% of people on my site aren't converting. So that's why we use these funnels. And the second question, no, Google Analytics is not a good <laughs> ending point for the data. It's not, it's not a data management platform. It's not a data warehouse either. So many times what I actually do is I use tools like Tableau or Clipfolio, very good like data viz, pro, data viz tools. They have their, um, ta Clipfolio has its own dedicated database. So I actually put stuff in there. Uh, I use BigQuery a lot. BigQuery is a, is a query interface for something called Bigtable, which is a, Google's cloud-based data warehouse. And you, it lets you do this like really, really fast queries on top of that. Amazon, I use it all the time. So uh, GA is one data source among a myriad of others that you can point towards a single data warehouse. And that's exactly how you should do it. But it's a maturity question, so you probably want to start with just GA because it can pull some stuff together really nicely, like offline measurement. But I would never ever use GA as the only vertical unless you honest to God, have a business which only exists on a single website with no human interaction going on elsewhere, then, then GA definitely would, would be okay. But it's a question of preference, of course, and how much time and money you have to invest in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have some more questions or we can go forward? Okay, but you have, it goes there. But I, I want to give you one question from, from me. Uh, before- uh, Vacation photos? No, 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 vacation photos, but uh, the bad jokes. Oh, man, I, I don't I, I, I want to give you a key to go uh, away from the stage, but the key is the bad joke. Oh, I'll, so. <laughs> I'll just let you look at myself. I'm just a bad joke. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, my, my English bad jokes are just so horrendous that I don't want to buzz you. I Do in your language. No matter. It will be in more funnier. Language. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> let me think about this. What is the on on Kissala and Nakkivakaralla? Ei, en mä ota sitä kysymystä. <laughs> ei, ei mitään. Katti voi olla nakkilassa ja nakki voi olla kattilassa. Thank you very much. Ottakaa näyttelijöitä. Seinaa! <laughs> <laughs>